Dr. Comey, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Tell us about the threats that you're seeing emerging in this fight against malaria. I, I wouldn't call them threats. Uh, I, would, I would talk about gaps, really. Uh, I think that the, the global health community has seen tremendous successes in the, the past decade, and we should be happy about this and tell that story much more than the story of threats. Uh, I do appreciate their challenges that we face right now that make it impossible to go forward the way we have been going and that necessitates us necessitates certain levels of changes uh, but i think that there are all the possibilities that exist now and there is this there are all the signs that it is indeed possible to go to zero uh, that doesn't mean we we don't have to do more i'm just saying that there are possibilities that you know it is possible to go to zero with regard to malaria transmission uh, to malaria control are these are these gaps? Are they gaps in funding? Are they gaps in research? Where where are you seeing them? It's it's good that you mention gaps in funding, but this is just one of them. I mean, there are, we have gaps in funding. We have gaps in the capability of the technologies we have today to 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 achieve the level of control that we need. We have gaps in in man, manpower. You know, human resources. We have gaps in how the information flows. Just to give you an example, at the moment. Uh, our best available technologies for malaria control in Africa include drugs, uh, uh, atomicity and combination therapy, and bed nets. These are really the, the two most important tools for, uh, for uh, management of the disease, but also prevention of the disease. But if you look at it, you actually see that even though bed nets have done so well, they only protect you for a, you know, a certain time of the night, usually the time when you are under, either, you know, in your bed and you know, if you remember to, to bring it down. But it does not protect you from those mosquitoes that would bite you when you're outside bed or before you get into your house. And yet we know that there are, of course, a lot of mosquitoes that bite people outside dwellings. And so this is a gap that we have to fill. And one way to fill it, of course, is to start working on technologies such as repellents. You know, special, special repellents is a good example, a kind of repellents that prevent mosquitoes from entering an area. And this you would put around your house. It would protect you for the duration before you get into your bed. Another technology which uh, I'm proud of very much, uh, because I, at least uh, my colleagues and myself have been working on this for a while, is to test the concept of developing synthetic human um, humans, let me say so, synthetic attractants, with which we can attract mosquitoes onto a, a lethal target and really kill them, whether they are resistant or not resistant. And we, we have a fantastic new device now, it's called Mosquito Landing Box that we developed in Ifakara. We, <coughs> we're still uh, um, in the process of finalizing it. But it works by attracting mosquitoes that would otherwise go to bite people. When these mosquitoes get into this, this little box, they get electrocuted immediately. And this box also has the capability of providing lighting to the nearby houses. So then here you have a system that is both an electrific a rural electrification program, but also a mosquito control program. This is another way that we can fill the gaps. There are many, many other options. Uh, I, I did mention that uh, we, we also have gaps with regard to funding. And so at the moment, we, we had yesterday that the global health community requires about $5.1 billion to control malaria on an annual basis, and yet we're receiving only about $2.3 billion. Of course, other than the gaps associated with how this available money is used, there are also gaps in the sense that you need to fill that gap. You need to get to $5.1 billion. And this we have to find some innovative mechanisms of getting the financing for whether it's by introducing some new taxations, whether it's by local governments putting in more money for their, for their people, or whether it's by, you know, there's seven billion people in the world each contributing a dollar a year. Whatever mechanism you want to do, we need that money. Then, of course, one critical thing that we must not forget is the people to do the job, the frontliners. And I'm, I'm, you know, I talk about this as someone who was born in Kenya, grew up there very much. I work in Tanzania in a place that you would call ground zero of malaria in the Kilombero River Valley, a place where in the 1980s we had 80% malaria prevalence, a place where very much, it's, I mean, the name Ifakara itself means a place you go to die because there were more chances that you would die than you would survive at that time. But it's also the place that we no longer have severe malaria. It's the same place that, you know, bed nets have, you know, cleared Anopheles gambi, the most notorious malaria vector in Africa. We no longer catch it there. 
it's it's gone completely almost you can i can say maybe it will rebound but at the moment we don't see it this is great success and we can attribute this of course to bed nets that have very much cleared this mosquito because it likes to bite people inside the house when people are sleeping and it feeds mostly on people not on anything else so if you're sleeping under a bed net that has insecticides it will clear this damn insect out of the space and this is what has happened this is a sign of progress in a very very difficult place even though we haven't gotten to zero in these kinds of places the fact that we have achieved 60 percent in a span of just about 10 years means that ladies and gentlemen we just have to keep pressing you know you can't you can't say you know, we tried, mm. you know. And, and how do you, when we talk about these technologies, how do you scale these up? How do you spread the word? Is there, is there a problem of information sharing there? Um, I don't know if information sharing is the big deal here, but it does matter, yes indeed. It matters in the sense that we need to tell the right people the right information. We need partners, you understand. And we need partners not only to give us the money, because the money, I mean, we, we can pay for some of these things, they are, they are cheap things. But we need partners in the sense that sometimes you have a new technology as a prototype. But you need an industrial manufacturer who has seen financial incentive in it, who can then make it in bulk. Make money out of it from people who can pay and equitably distribute this by making the device available from people who cannot pay. In the end, the positive externality is everybody gains. So, Th this kind of partnerships the, the, will necessitate that the information about these new technologies flows in the right direction. At the moment, this information flows mainly in published journal papers, which only fellow scientists read. So actually, if you look at the big picture, the scientists, we are not communicating. Because we think that if I publish six or seven papers in the biggest journals possible, then I've communicated. But you see, it's like preaching to the choir. You know, the... If I am a priest, I go to church, all these guys already know what I'm going to talk about. They know Jesus is the son of God or ABCD. I don't need to tell them that. It's the same thing we do when we publish scientific papers and scientific journals. We don't communicate. What we need to do is to talk to people who matter, if I may put that in quotes. People who will take this information and say, I don't care what the name of the mosquito is, but I want to kill that mosquito. If I get this thing, I'm going to give it to some guy who just knows how to build the stuff, sell the stuff, make money out of it, distribute it to all those who need it, and save lives. This kind of communication has to happen in a different platform. It could be via, you know, the media, the internet, you know, it could be by me sitting in the streets, in the market, and shouting. You know, it could be me speak, coming to CSIS, and talking to people who can then go to, you know, uh, Congress and say, man, put in an extra billion dollars here for the next five years. And this is how we're going to change lives. Let's hope this video adds to that. Dr. Akuma, thanks well, for joining us. I appreciate it.